tell the world I'll sing a song. It's a better place since you came along. Since you came along, 'cause it feels like I've opened my eyes again, and the colors are golden and bright again. There's a song in my heart. I feel like I belong. It's a better place since you came along. It's a better. Hey guys, I'm Alex from the New Mom School, and today is a really special topic that's near and dear to my heart for many reasons.、Um, some maybe less positive than others, but in the long run, they end up to be positive because it makes us better. And、yeah. um, My guest today is also really special. I think I say that about every different topic that we talk about because I really, truly feel like I really just have the, the best people in my corner and in my circle. And、um, uh, Laura Navarro Pickens, who I'm here with today, came to me.、Um, I don't even really remember how we connected. I may have reached out to you. Yeah, I think so. I think so. But we, when we finally got together, I had felt like we just instantly connected,、mm-hmm. and it was really, really easy to talk to each other. And、um, what you do is such important work, which of course we'll get into. But why don't you introduce yourself and what you do? Okay. And a little bit about yourself, maybe your family, your、okay. kids. Okay, yeah. Good. Well, I'm I'm Laura Navarro Pickens, and、um, I'm a psychotherapist. In particular, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I work with mostly moms, but moms and dads <clears throat> who have had issues either during a pregnancy or、um, in the postpartum period, whether they've had、um, difficulty with mood disorders or anxiety disorders or just traumatic experiences.、Um, And helping them sort of adjust to those things, and and helping them to have as happy as a pregnancy or postpartum period as possible. So for the moms and the dads, the parents,、um, and then I also、um, work with.、Um, uh, parents who've lost babies. So during pregnancy or during.、Um, Uh, the newborn phase, or a little bit later, but I work with、um, bereaved parents to help them adjust to、uh, life without、um, their child. So we're here today to talk about attachment,、mm-hmm. infant mother or infant caretaker attachment, as I like to call it, and、um, it's one of my favorite topics for a lot of reasons. But one of the the biggest reasons that I love talking about it is because. I find moms to have such a sigh of relief after learning about what it means. So、um, we are not necessarily talking about attachment parenting, which、okay. I think gets a little bit、yeah. uh, convoluted. And、mm-hmm. we're not talking about a parenting style. We're actually talking about attachment theory, which has. Decades and decades of research behind、yeah. it, and it's really this simple, complex thing、yep. that happens between an infant, a newborn, and their primary caretaker、That's、in、right. the first few months of life. However, moms are really surprised to find out what it actually affects in their child the lo- in the long term, right? In the long term, yeah.、Yes. So. From a therapist perspective, why don't you tell moms a little bit about what attachment is,、mm-hmm. what it means,、mm-hmm. and you know why it's important, and、mm-hmm. and then we'll kind of go from there. Okay, sounds good. So yeah, so、um, yeah, attachment is really、uh, that bond, like Alex said, between the parent, the, the primary caregiver, which in in a lot of circumstances is the mother, but does not always have to be the mother. And the baby, and then that goes through,、um, you know, the child's life. So while you know, in the babyhood, and then in the toddlerhood, and all of that, <clears throat> and hopefully that the there's a strong attachment as when the、uh, baby is an infant,、um, and then moving forward. 
And why it's important is because we want the baby to feel safe and um, calm and um, attached to the caregiver so that they can feel safe to explore and go out of their little you know baby comfort zone mm -hmm. to explore and do things that are new to them um, if they don't feel that secure attachment then all of those things can be interrupted right and so they they may not feel safe to explore and to play the way that they need to mm -hmm. which is a really uh, big deal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which of course which of course plays into their self-esteem. That's right. It's like, that is just so everything. huge to me. It's everything because it leads into so many things. When I yeah. got really kind of deeper into my learning and research and research, you know, just researching attachment in general, yeah. I was so shocked to learn that it actually affects a child's academic performance right. and their amazing? personality. I know. Like, that's crazy to me. So yeah. at, the way you were cared for in the first six months of your life actually affects your personality right. and your academic performance. And then a big one is relationships down the line. Huge. 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 So why does it, why does it affect relationships down the line? Well, if you think about it... <clears throat> So a child is um, d doesn't doesn't innately understand their emotional state. They don't innately understand their feelings, and it's our job as a caregiver to be calm and tune into our own emotional state, so that we can help the child tune into their emotional state and get their emotional needs met. And when they get their emotional needs met, they can more. Um, they're able to be more there for other people as they as they get older or they can empathize more with peers and all that sort of thing. If they don't understand their own emotional state, they're going to have a really hard time understanding other people's emotional state. So mm -hmm. if you can imagine, you know, it's it's normal for toddlers to, you know, kind of do whatever. But as they're getting older, if um, I don't understand and I just push my friend Alex because it just feels right and I don't understand that she doesn't like being pushed, um, because it doesn't make sense to me, that's going to cause problems. She's not going to want to be my friend. And maybe she's going to tell that person over there that I push. And, and, and then so, we're not going to have a good relationship. That's right. Right. That's right. right. And so that's the thing. And so it is really, it, it, and like Alex said, it's, it's the, it affects the self-esteem. It affects the physical development as well, the mm -hmm. academic development, and definitely the self-esteem and relationships yeah. for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting as you were talking about the pushing that instantly made me think of social skills Yeah, because, yeah. you know, toddlers kind of lack social skills yeah, yeah. and they're sort of <laughs> in their like reptilian brain completely. And, um, yeah. and so it's just, it's really <laughs> funny that you say that because I think toddlers who do have a healthier attachment are able to maybe comprehend social skills a yes. little bit better yeah. and learn that that pushing maybe is not okay and maybe they'll stop doing it right you know in a more understanding or they'll learn empathy that's a big one empathy is a big one a right big one because we want we want our kids to be able to empathize that's really huge yeah. right um so and be kind and be kind <sighs> And be kind, right? Yeah. Because if because if we are in a society of people that don't have empathy or are unable to access that, it's it's a really difficult place to live. Yeah. It's not a world people want to live. No. <laughs> well, it's kind of happening in our world right now. Right. It's it's tough. It's tough to yes. see, especially knowing what I know and you knowing what you know, to be able to see behind, you know, to see the pain behind people who commit these just incredibly horrible mm -hmm. acts of mm -hmm. violence. And, you know, I, I think my husband is really confused as to why I say, God, you know, he must be, he must be really hurting yes. to go and hurt that many people. Yes. And people say, well, how can you empathize with that person? Right. And I say, it's not that I'm empathizing. It's that I can, I can, I know yeah. That there's something that happened in that person's life that that disconnected them with the ability to empathize and not want to hurt other people. That's right. 
That's right. And if I can tell a story too. Yes, so it please. reminds me of, um, so my husband is a, is an artist and he does murals and, um, he was, has been working on a mural, um, and it was tagged right with graffiti. Mm-hmm. And, and it was interesting because most people's reaction to it was, Oh my gosh, you must be so upset that that happened. And it's so devastating. And it is, it's mm-hmm. devastating and mm-hmm. it's upsetting. But his perspective was, but I keep thinking about what that person was thinking the moment he made that he we assume it's a he yeah. <laughs> made that mark on the wall to really deface someone else's artwork. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that that's empathy. Yeah. Right. To come from that place to say, what must he have been thinking? And that's heartbreaking, right? To have that kind of whatever's in you, like that anger at the world yeah. or whatever's happening. Right. right? I want to ruin someone else's beauty it's so deep here right oh, yeah. like yeah. Oh, yeah. we can like really get into it right now and um i i will we'll get more into things as the conversation goes yeah. on i'm sure but sure. those stories are great maybe my husband can hang out with your husband and learn a few tools yeah <laughs> We call my husband, we call him a sensitive because oh. he's not insensitive. Like yeah. he doesn't do things to be malicious or hurt yeah. people, but he doesn't quite have that sensitive gene. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I can, I can, I can definitely speak to what my theory is of why, mm-hmm. but we all have our childhoods, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, um, we do. We do. We, <laughs> we all have our sure stuff. We sure do. We all have our stuff. Every single one of us. Yeah. And, um, so yes, we like to say he's a sensitive, but he is, he's trying, I mean, being married to me, like he's had to, (laughs) he's had to step up a little bit, but there's also that piece where I think that, you know, girls, you know, Alex and I used to be girls and now we're women, you know, we are socialized to be sensitive, right? I mean, it's really kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's a gender role, um, thing in our society, right? Where we're, it's, it's, we're much easier to express emotion and tears, but boys are really not in general, not encouraged to, um, um, to, uh, express sensitivity and, you know, tears or, you know, usually angers the emotion that they're allowed to, um, uh, express. So I think in some ways that the car, the deck is kind of against them. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but it's never too late to learn. No, it's It's never too late to learn. (laughs) And when you speak about anger, it's interesting because the, the therapist that we work with that specializes in relationships, she always talks about how anger is a secondary emotion. It is. And so the fact that boys are there, they've been accepted to be able to talk about anger or to say that I'm angry is a little bit unfair because they're not even learning to express an actual emotion because behind anger is usually what the emotion is. That's right. And that makes me think about a brand new dad. Mm. Oh yeah. Okay. So let's let's talk talk about brand new dads for a second. Let's talk about it. Yeah. So we know that brand new dads often feel insecure. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, um, a new mom feels insecure and yes. really, really just their confidence is just shot to the ground. Yes. So what do you find most commonly is how you find a new dad? Okay. So I, I what I would say about that is I think it really depends on the mom's mental health state, mm. right? So if it's just a mom who's sort of having the regular adjustment issues, maybe some baby blues, which we can maybe talk about mm-hmm. in a little bit, but just a little bit of adjustment problem, but she's, she's doing okay. She feels like herself. It's not a um, diagnosable mental health issue, like a depression or an anxiety. If, if the mom is just kind of, um, kind of going through the normal things, I think that that's a different situation than a dad who is experiencing his wife going through, um, a a mental health kind of crisis Mm -hmm. in the form of a, either a depression or an anxiety or a psychosis. So, but let's just say the mom is not in the diagnosable state, right? And she's just kind of like going, oh my gosh, I'm not having any sleep. Oh my gosh, my boobs are hurting. Oh my gosh, I'm still healing. And all these things are going on. I think a dad feels very, um, um, not in control and helpless, helpless for sure. Totally. Right. And so, and, and the dad could have even prepared for, you know, gone to the classes. I, I, you know, over at Hogue, I see lots of dads in those classes and it's awesome. But, you know, 
you can never quite prepare for what's actually going to happen to your body, to your brain, <laughs> to your home <laughs> yeah. when a new baby comes in because it's such a huge job, mm -hmm. right? So I think that oftentimes they feel even if they have tried to prepare, they feel unprepared. Mm -hmm. um, generally, the I, I love working with men and generally what I see is that men in general feel like if their wives aren't feeling okay, then that somehow makes them feel bad and it makes them feel like they're doing a bad job as a husband. Mm -hmm. Whereas I don't see that with women. I don't mm -hmm. see women um, saying, my husband doesn't feel good, that must be my fault. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that dads take that on in a protector role, yeah. right? And they oftentimes feel like, well, I can't, I can't um, soothe the child like the mom can. I don't have breasts to feed. Well, yeah, if have, you're breastfeeding, doesn't, yeah. doesn't have lactating breasts right. to feed the baby. <laughs> so he feels like, okay, mom's got to do it. Mom, you know, I've got to just, you know, and, yeah. and since she's there doing that, I might as I, we, we shouldn't both be awake. <laughs> Right, right. I should go ahead and go to sleep, right? right? And in some ways, that's really true. Yeah. But we have to, they have to find the balance of when is it um, taking care of yourself and when is it abandoning? Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. So a lot of education. I feel like I should get you over here. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's true. I mean, men do feel helpless because we, we want results. We want, we're doers, you know what I mean? Yeah, so them, totally. You know, like, what? Or I'm just out of here. Yeah, totally. He's got three kids. Oh, I didn't even ask you. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you know. Yeah. Right. Is that is it resonating? Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah, big time. Yeah. yeah. I think our whole series has like transformed how you. Oh yeah. Like, <laughs> going back in time. Everything. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah, and it's never too late. You know, like we said. So we have we're talked about dads, but um, I want to bring it back to moms because I really love focusing on the new mom and helping to empower yes. and encourage a, a new mom to be the best version of herself. And when we talk about attachment, I think that when I give that like first list of things of everything it does for your child and has so much impact on the rest of their life. Moms are like, dun, dun, dun. oh my God. Oh, that's a lot of, oh, that's what I hear all the time. Okay, no pressure, Alex. Like that's what the moms say in classes. Oh yeah. And I said, but guess what? You're going to see why it's no pressure. Right. So then I kind of dip into Eric Erickson's psychosocial stages of development yep. and how the only thing a baby has to learn in the first 12 to 18 months of life is whether they can trust the world or not. That's right. So how does a new mom help their baby learn to trust the world and feel safe? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so I think that, you know, Alex's point is such a good one in terms of that pressure to feel like, Oh my gosh, if I do it wrong, I'm going to mess up my kid the rest for the rest of their lives. And which you'll do anyway. Which, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, you know what? There's no such thing as a perfect parent mm -hmm. and we, we, none of us should really be striving to be a perfect parent because that's not, here's the thing. We don't want to be a perfect parent because we don't want our children to feel like they need to be perfect in our families to be okay. Mm -hmm. They don't need to be perfect. They just need to be who they are. Yeah, should they be doing their best? Yeah, we should be doing our best. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we are too exhausted to do our best, and our best is maybe 65% that day. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's our best for that day, mm -hmm. right? So it's okay. You don't need to be perfect, and we don't want to be perfect. So, um, so th But there's that pressure because every parent, well, I can't say every parent, but almost every parent, that is our ultimate fear is that somehow what we're doing or what we're not doing is going to – permanently affect in a negative way our child, mm -hmm. right? So um, it's like that parenthood scene, um, the scene from Parenthood where the, the child goes up to bat and um, it's Steve Martin's son and he sees the kid missing the ball or missing, you know, missing, hitting the ball. And, and he fast forwards and that kid is like a homeless person who's living in the park versus he hits the home run and he becomes like the mayor of New York or something <laughs> like that. Right. And that's like what we feel. I feel like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, this is a make or break moment right now. Mm -hmm. This is a make or break moment right now. And there's so much pressure that we put on ourselves. Our children just need to know that we are there as consistently as we can be, we're trying to meet their needs, and and those are those are really important things. So when when the the child is a baby, some of the ways to is that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. 
I, I got a little lost in my own head around that. But um, ways to ways to connect are just by tuning in. But even as I was preparing for today, one of the one of the themes that kept coming up that actually is such a simple simple piece, but that I keep forgetting is that our main goal really should be to, to get ourselves into a calm state when we're dealing with our kids. So how many times are we dealing with our kids when we are in a totally stressed out and zoinked out state because we are trying to get to a million places, we're trying to do a million things, and we're a lot of times distracted and not calm. So especially when you have a newborn, oh. this stranger that's crying, and you don't know what they're trying to tell you. Yes. And the sound of that cry is just, just irks you to your bones. Yes. Yeah. And also, so let's, let's take this aside and then we'll go back that, you know, some people too have, um, you know, many people have not, obviously not had ch perfect childhoods, but they're beyond not perfect. Sometimes they're, um, they've been either neglected childhoods or abusive childhoods. And sometimes the, the crying of the baby can really trigger a lot in moms and dads. And so what That's happens going to trigger for, me right now, yeah. because I feel I experienced that. Yes. And so, and so what happened for you? The crying triggers me. So right. when, when my babies were crying or they're, um, expressing emotion yeah. in some way, um, oftentimes it was when my older son was more of a toddler yeah. and would kind of emotionally melt, melt down. It would put me into the red zone. Yes. Because... I, I, um, I would get angry, which is that secondary emotion, yep. but it was really because I felt like I couldn't meet his needs. It was fear. It was fear. It was fear. Yeah. So you were afraid I'm not going to be able to meet his needs. And then your mind probably went, went, went really fast. Yeah. And it goes so fast from fear to anger that you don't even feel the fear. Yeah. You just go into the anger because yeah. we know how to do that much better. Yeah. It's and all of this is happening, you know, in a second. Yeah. Right. And this is a lot for a mom to be dealing with. And you are definitely not the only one. Yeah. I also had a lot of trouble with the the type of crying and staying calm. Yeah. And who it is motherhood is the hardest job in the world. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that newborn period is just so brutal. Like you said, when you're just tuning into their needs. Yeah. And you, you know, like some of those basic ways to build that connection so that your baby trusts you yeah. are just responding to those basic needs. Just responding. That's you know right. how you change a diaper 20 times a day or <laughs> you change their clothes and you hold them if they're upset and yeah. you feed them when they're hungry. So those are the things that make them trust the world. That's right. It sure does. That's right. Yeah. So, so you're already be, doing it. You're already doing it. It doesn't have to be all super complex, right? That's true. Yeah. It's, it's meeting their basic needs. Yeah. Right. And then yeah. they know like my mom's there, my dad's there. Hey, my people are here. It's yeah. Cool. Yeah. Right. And you are most likely talking and interacting with your baby. Yeah. For the most part. Yeah. You might be singing, you might be dancing around with them. So those are all ways that you're connecting yeah, and building sure. that attachment for because sure. remember the only thing they have to learn is that the world is a safe place. The world is a safe that place. That their needs will be met. That's right. Um, I think that because of lack of sleep, oh. moms turn to sleep training yeah. as soon as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes that as soon as possible is a little too early mm -hmm. because it's a little counterintuitive to building that secure attachment. Mm -hmm. When you're working with moms who are sleep deprived, mm -hmm. what is your best advice as an alternative to sleep training? Like what are some things that moms can do other than sleep training mm -hmm. to be able to get themselves more sleep? 
So yeah, that so sleep is huge. And and number one, there are some people, some some people in general, but some moms specifically that are uh, more sensitive than the average person to sleep deprivation. So some yeah. people are not that sensitive, and um, and so then they kind of take the sleep deprivation a little bit more in stride. But there are some people who are extremely sensitive to it, mm-hmm. and they really have trouble. And so though these are especially the people who need to really be careful because you may be having an okay experience, but the sleep deprivation can really push you into um, a, a, an area, a red zone that is just, it's, it's really difficult to get back out of. So And dangerous. And uh, yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Because really actually it's a mental health emergency if you haven't had sleep for several, several hours, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you can start hallucinating. There could be all kinds of things that can happen. Mm-hmm. So one of the things actually, one of my clients was actually just dealing with this yesterday. And so, um, she's, I'm thinking about it in my mind and she was having a lot of trouble with sleeping because even if, um, even if your doctor is saying you can, the baby can, um, can, can cry a little bit and it's okay. Our brains are so attuned to the, the crying that we weren't, even if we're trying to sleep train or not, we're waking up. And so my suggestion to her was, um, ha- you know, have somebody else come watch the baby and go and go out of the house to take a nap or have mm-hmm. the baby taken out of the house to be cared for by somebody mm-hmm. and then go sleep in your own bed for a while. Those kinds of things can really help. Mm-hmm. I also think that if um, dad's back to work, so if dad's not back to work, then you guys can really trade off with the sleep. Um, but if dad's back to work, one of the things that you can do is, um, definitely taking shifts with the baby in terms of feeding. So having, um, dad maybe stay up later till like 11 or so do that late night feeding, having mom sleep, um, from nine till maybe like two o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then every either Saturday or Sunday, one of the couple, so the mom maybe gets to sleep in on Saturday and then the dad gets to sleep in on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So one person is sleeping in at least one day a week, Mm -hmm. right? So that can help. And for a lot of moms, they can nap when their baby is napping. And so they always say, you know, sleep when your baby's sleeping. But there are many women, especially women who have some anxiety going on, they can't sleep when their baby's sleeping. Their brain is going like this. And then by the time they do fall asleep, their baby is crying. And then that kind of jolts them into a fight or flight response. Yeah. Right. And so that is super unpleasant. Right. And so because you're saying to yourself, I need to sleep right now, sleep, sleep, but sleep, I can't sleep, sleep, sleep right sleep. now. And then if I don't sleep right now, I'm never going to get sleep. And it just throws oh, you over. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. So, so then I like to say for those moms, it's, it's not an, it's not for you to feel guilty that you can't sleep. Some women just can't yes. and it's okay if you can't, there's nothing wrong with you or, or, or maybe you're having an anxiety issue, but um, but I think sometimes that whole, like, just sleep when your baby's sleeping. It's so easy. I it's hate not, that. It's not so easy. I never tell a mom sleep when the baby sleeps. I wish the term would change to rest when the baby sleeps. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Because I yeah. like to say what I figured out with my kids was I started doing everything that I needed to do while they were awake. Because at this point, yes. you know, it's not like you have to chase around a crawling baby. That's right. This is a newborn. They can be in a carrier, yeah. a wrap. They can be in a rock and play next to you. They can be on a on a blanket next to you while you're folding laundry. They can be in the kitchen while you're eating. They can sit in front of you in the, in the little bassinet or a a rock and play while, while you're um, preparing food or washing dishes. Totally. Right. So do all those tasks while you're awake. Yeah. So that when baby does go to sleep, you can also rest. Rest. Yes. And then sometimes you doze off because you don't feel like you have so many things to do. Right. And the pressure is not there. Yeah. That insomnia was, I had that sleep, that oh. uh, postpartum insomnia, and um, it builds and builds and builds. Yeah. And like week three at postpartum yeah. is absolute worst. Oh, yeah. Because now you've gone three weeks with no sleep, really. Oh, yeah. yeah and yeah, so yeah. now yeah. you're completely melting down. Mm-hmm. And um, you feel like, you know, I'm not going to make this. This isn't, I'm not going to get through this. This isn't for me. Right. What have we done? This is a mistake. Yeah. Our marriage isn't going to last. Right. I mean, you just go to a really, really dark oh, place. Yeah. yeah. And so, so knowing if, if you're having those feelings that, that this is, these are the feelings that other moms have as well. 
part of the problem is that we don't talk about it. And so it feels really closeted and we feel like every, everyone's doing it better than me because I'm looking on Instagram and everyone's doing amazing and I'm the only one who's screwing everything up. And what's wrong with me? And then, and then all the shame, the whole shame thing starts shame. to happen. Oh my gosh. So, so give yourself a big fat break and just do the best that you can and get out there and talk to other moms. Oh my gosh. If, if I, I've, I've told Alex this, if, if I could do my postpartum, my baby making days over again, that is the one thing I would for sure change. I, I saw a therapist. Um, I, I, did treatment for my uh, postpartum um, depression and anxiety, and that helped a lot. But I really, if I would have been in a circle of women with um, newborn babies also, and to just to bond with and mm -hmm. to see that they were also in a similar state that I was in, that would have helped a lot. Yeah. It would have made a huge difference because it's important to have those folks around you, your little tribe, yeah. right? Yeah. And and to just say, yes, I'm having a really hard time getting out and, and meeting you for coffee, but let's just keep doing it. Let's just keep trying. And maybe we'll just only see each other for five minutes, mm -hmm. but at least it's a, it's an accomplishment. I got out of the house. I really encourage moms to, um, on the days that they feel like they can't, they just can't do it and they just can't get out of the house. I just say to them, don't worry about how you look. Yeah. Don't worry about what you're wearing. Oh, yeah. Your baby can still be in their nighttime diaper and oh, their yeah. pajamas. Oh, yeah. Just get here. Yeah. I promise you'll feel better after you're here. For sure. And if you're in a place where you don't have a program like the new mom school, I mean, my dream would be to have one everywhere, right? Yeah. But if you're in a place that doesn't have it, go to the park, get outside. Yeah. Just find moms with the strollers and just go talk to them. Oh, yeah. And just say, hey, let's get together. Mm -hmm. Or find a local Facebook group that has moms in your area. If they're mom shaming each other, get out of the group and find another one. Oh yeah. But if you get together with some women, make your own circle and get together. And I, I would recommend doing it at the same time every week mm -hmm. because then you know that it's happening. You don't have to find people's schedules that That's match. Right. That's yeah. right. And also, can I just also say that when it comes to looking for mom friends, you know, you're not, it's a lot like dating, right? It's a lot like dating, but also I just would encourage you to lower your bar in terms of friendships. Mm -hmm. Maybe you end up, you, you, you see a mom there and maybe she has a different political persuasion, mm -hmm. or maybe she definitely looks different than what you would normally look for in a friend. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter because they, they may not be lifelong friends. They may be a, a friend for this chapter in your life yeah. and that's okay. Or maybe they may be a lifelong friend who don't, who knows, but they don't have to be the perfect friend that you had plenty of time to look for in your 20s yeah right they may just be a for now friend and that's okay because if you can talk about baby stuff that's yeah, gonna be it for sure yes and you know just in all fairness yeah as a newborn mom it's not always the best representation of ourselves right? oh, my gosh. on the exterior <laughs> I mean if I think back to like my newborn phase I mean wow it was it, it wasn't my best foot forward, no. you know, cause no I clean way. up nice, but I, <laughs> but I, I had a, I had tough pregnancies. I gained a ton of weight. Yeah. I really lost myself. I was really uncomfortable. Um, you know, I gained 55 pounds with my first baby yeah. and I'm short, I'm yeah. a small framed person yeah. and I gained 45 with my second. And I mean, I think I put on my husband's sweatpants at the end of my first pregnancy and was like, I can't believe that these are, that these fit me right now. Like it was like, yeah. how did I do this to myself? Yes. How does it happen? Yes. Right. So then you talk about shame. Yes. Then oh, like the gosh. baby's out of you and now you're, so there's just, there's yeah. just so many levels of things on, on a mom's mind. Oh yeah. Tons. And then you have this baby and before the baby comes, you're, you expect it to be so different mm -hmm. than it is. Yeah. And um, so now not only are you having a hard time yeah. taking care of the baby, but then you're also feeling shame that you're not enjoying it. That's right. Right. Exactly. So then that blocks a lot of mom's attachment. So if I can tell you to remove that second level of shame mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. own the fact that this is new territory, moms. Like. Yes. You're not supposed to know what to do. This is a stranger in your house. It's a stranger in your and house. Just own and just that. And they're kind of a bad roommate, by the way. Um, so we've talked so much already about mm -hmm. kind of the 
what the picture looks like, right? Um, and um, I want to talk about a little bit of so social media and Google and blogs and um, articles can be yeah. really detrimental to a new mom um, or even a mom of older kids. I fell into that right around. I, I, I had some challenges with my older son mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I definitely fell into that trap when he was getting older yeah. and I would go on social media and it would just ruin my day. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. so let's talk about that. Yeah. Let's talk yeah. about what happens with moms and you yeah. know, what they can do instead. Yeah. So, well, so, so if, if I have a client who comes in and says, I'm really struggling and I'm feeling like the whole comparison trap is really getting to me, that sort of thing, or they're maybe saying it in not so many words, I'll ask them how much time they're spending on social media and, and encourage them to even take a little bit of a vacation, a little bit of a break. And, um, and it doesn't have to be forever. So this can be for, you know, people that I work with that have had baby loss because seeing a lot of ultrasound pictures or seeing a lot mm. of look at how amazingly cute my baby is with this big bow in my hair and yeah. seeing those pictures can be very traumatizing. So for hashtag those hashtag so in love, so in love, yeah. hashtag blessed. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it's wonderful and it's great that they are, but you know, I think it's, I have another client. She's so cute. She says, I can't compare my everyday reel with another person's um, bonus reel or something like that. Yeah. Like, like that's their perfect, that's their perfect moment of their yeah. perfect day. What we don't post is we don't post like our kids eating a bag of Cheetos saying this is the fourth hour of TV today because yeah. I can't take it anymore. Yeah. We would never dare post that, but we're going to post like the most amazing moment. Yeah. Right. So, and I know that some moms do that because they are barely holding on. And so they need to have those moments that they, that they post to say, I'm okay. I'm and I am mom. actually check. I'm doing yes. it. And the validation and the validation. Yeah, we need it. Yeah. Um, but I think that, um, it really can be a trap. And so it is completely okay and probably beneficial to take a little break from social media mm -hmm. and just focus in on you. Mm -hmm. And if you want to reach out to somebody, maybe you, um, text somebody or call mm -hmm. somebody or make plans to meet up with them and mm -hmm. actually see how they're actually doing, not how they're, how they're Facebook doing, yeah. do you know? So, um, because it can also feel much more really in your heart rewarding to be face to face. Like this is a great, you know, this yeah. is, this is a, a neat thing that we're doing right now, right? Yeah. It's a real connection. Yeah. So, there's that, but then there's also this whole idea of perfectionism, and um, and I think that moms, it's tough because you know a lot of a lot of women, we are multitaskers, and we feel like, gosh, we have these um, jobs, and we're multitasking, and and that's what motherhood is, and so I'm going to be really great at it. Um, but then when they actually are in it, in the role of motherhood, and it is a lot of multitasking, but it is it's so different than what you think it's going to be, right? Mm -hmm. It's so much, it's not what you expect mm -hmm. and it's so much more difficult. So we feel like, gosh, I should be doing it like this, this, and this, but you're always falling short, mm -hmm. always falling short. There's always dishes to be done. There's mm -hmm. always laundry to be done. You know, your kid's not dressed all cute and, 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 but it feels bad. It feels like everybody's doing it mm -hmm. better than me. And the reason that we bring this up with the topic of attachment is because yeah. when we get caught up in this perfectionism, that does interfere negatively yeah. with that that secure, trying to create that secure attachment with our babies. Yes. Because we're spending time and focusing on getting that perfect picture, yeah. posting that perfect picture, or reading the blog of a woman who has more kids than us who maybe seems to be doing it better than us yeah. and then feeling like we're not going to be able to live up to that or, or be that blogger. Like how does she have time to write those blogs with all those kids? Yes. You know, like that kind oh, of stuff. Gosh, yeah. I used to get in that. Yeah. And so that definitely interferes. So the mom's state of mind yeah. is so crucial to the attachment of the baby. Oh gosh. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah because it stresses us out. Yeah. And then we come to the baby stressed, and that is not a helpful place, right? Correct. So we want to be as calm as we can be, right, in terms of um, taking care of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that is number one. So I think the other thing is that we put our own needs – seriously at the bottom if it's yeah. if it's even on the sheet yeah. right i mean everyone else's needs are more important than ours but i mean i think i'm proof and you're probably proof that you you cannot put yourself last on the list right. and you cannot put take yourself off of the list entirely you have to put yourself at least a little further up and maybe as with time you go a little further up where you really need to be is you really need to be number 1 you sure do you have to be number 1 because the thing is, is that if you are not taking care of yourself, the mom really is the center of the family and everything else is falling apart. Mm-hmm, right. Mm-hmm. And I think we try because we feel selfish. If we're taking care of ourselves, we feel selfish. If we're reading our own um, people magazine article or searching the web, we feel like I shouldn't be doing that. I don't have mm-hmm. a right to be doing that, mm-hmm. but you do. And you I sure usually do. say, yeah. And I usually say to my moms that if you feel selfish by what you're doing, you're probably on track. That's such great. And that is such great advice. <laughs> so true. Because we're not used to it. I know. And so if you're, if you feel like you're being selfish, you're right on track. I mean, you know, so, so good. If you're selfish, good. Because you know what hashtag I love? What? Self-care isn't selfish. Oh my gosh. I love uh-huh. that. That's my hashtag. I love That's, that. I love that. Oh my gosh. And then sometimes I'll even add it's necessary. Yeah. Like self-care isn't selfish. It's necessary. It is necessary. So for sure. Yes. And don't, I mean, for me, I love my boys seeing how important yes. I put myself that's really important. That role modeling. Like, don't you want, not don't you want, we want our kids to put themselves first. You know, we don't want them to go off and have relationships with other people, with other people where they feel as though they're not worthy. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And we're that first relationship with our kid. That's right. So that relationship between us is going to be their experience with how a relationship should feel that's right especially a it it should be a mutually respectful relationship right so um yeah you know our our babies we hear often that the baby should uh the baby should should adjust and be on my schedule Mm -hmm. but unfortunately nature doesn't do that Mm mm-hmm a baby has its own schedule mm-hmm. and they have needs 24 hours a day. They do have needs. And yep. if you go down to the basics of basics of attachment in the newborn phase, a baby has needs 24 hours a day. It's our job to meet those needs 24 mm-hmm. hours a day. Mm-hmm. So if mom cannot meet those needs 24 hours a day, which she can't, mm-hmm. there has to be another set of hands that meets those needs when mom has her needs. Mm-hmm. But That's all you have to do as a new mom to build that healthy attachment is respond to those needs in a calm and confident way. We're all a work in progress. Right. A hundred percent. And attachment, the beautiful thing that I love is that it can be repaired. So if you're six months down the road and you feel like you didn't do it, which I can assure you, you did on a lot of levels because that perfectionism just, ugh, it's a killer. It's a killer. It's a killer. Um, If you feel like you didn't do what we're talking about, which I can assure you, you did, just know that you can always be better. So all you have to do in your daily life Mm -hmm. is sit down with your kid for 10, 20 minutes a day and let them lead you in play and go into their world, go into their world. Yes. And try to enjoy it. That's the other thing. Okay. So it's not, again, it's not going to be 24 hours of it. It's probably going to be 10, 20 minutes of it. Mm -hmm. So I know you probably don't want to sing the same song Mm -hmm. for the hundred billionth time Mm -hmm. or the same book, but try to just be in the moment and know that this time will end Mm -hmm. and there will be a time that they are pushing you like this. And so this kind of adoration that they have for you is <laughs> it's bleeding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And that's all good. Yeah. So just try to enjoy it. You know, I know it's not fun to maybe do um, activities like boy activities that maybe you don't like because you're a girl and you like wish you could do nails, but just be in the moment. Yeah. 
just yeah. be in the moment. I remember I laying it. down on that activity mat with my baby being like, oh, oh my God, this is so boring. Oh yeah. Like this blows and like, this is not what I want to do. No. But the baby was so happy. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's so monotonous. Right. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a monotony thing too. And, and, but that will come to an end too. Mm -hmm. So everything comes to an end, right? Everything is really in stages and phases. Mm -hmm. And so, so when you're having a really difficult time with your baby, because there are times when they're just more difficult, yeah. that will end mm -hmm. and it will be an easier phase. Mm -hmm. And when you're in an amazing phase and everything is really peaches and cream, that will end too. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so it's so always true. like this and you are yeah. on a big roller coaster yeah. ride. Yeah. But that man, that monotony has a purpose, which I like to say because babies thrive off of that same boringness. They love it. They just, and that, that actually leads me to a really great point about attachment is routine. Yes. Yes. Rhythm. That they need to know what to expect next. Yes. Right. They need to know that you're, they either eat before their nap, they, they, they sleep, they sleep before they eat, whatever it is, but that routine and that sameness. Yeah. They know what to expect, so they feel safe. Yes. And it's really true. They do. That and nighttime routine. Anxiety. It yeah. really does. By six months, we want that in place. So by just aim, by six months, you really want a really, really set nighttime routine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and when we say also routine, like, so don't, if, if, if you're in the newer stages of, um, of your baby, don't think that we're saying everything needs to be on a routine by week two. Um, the baby really does lead the way. Mm -hmm. 100%. So you have to go with their sort of routine. But then once you kind of get their rhythms, then you kind of go, okay, so I know what to expect. This is what their rhythm is. I'm going to kind of put a little bit of structure to that. And so that I know what to expect mm -hmm. and that they know what to expect. And with that routine for us, it makes us feel calmer sure. too as moms. Mm -hmm. It makes us feel calmer too as moms because we know what to expect and for we sure. know when basically their nap is and basically how long it's going to be. Yeah. So we know when our rejuvenation time can come to a hundred percent. Yeah. That is just so true. I, I have moms use an app that tracks That's babies, so you know, when they're eating, when they're sleeping so that we can help the mom determine a pattern of what the baby's doing, because there's usually a pattern, determine even though it pattern. doesn't feel like it. it doesn't feel like there's a pattern, yes. but when you start tracking how long a baby is awake for, before they start melting down, you can actually start putting them to sleep a little earlier than that yeah. so that they don't get to that point. Yes. And it makes it much easier for them to go to sleep, which then gives mom that anticipation of when is my baby going to sleep next so that I, I that. can also take a break. Okay. That is a genius app. I did not know that existed. Yeah. I love that. Okay, great. Yeah. That's good. And I, you know, there'll probably be different ones as time goes on, yeah. Oh, yeah. but um, <laughs> find an app that can track all of that. There's, there's multiple ones out there. Some of yes. them cost a few dollars, but it's worth it. The one that we used, um, it was, it's called baby connect. And I like mm. it because multiple caregivers can track the same baby. So if you oh, have, great. like if dad's home with the baby or if nanny's home with the baby yeah. or grandma or grandpa, they can put in on their phones yeah. what the baby's doing great. so that you can see what's happening with your baby or you can just kind of get that continuity. That is great. Mm -hmm. Love it. But that really, that the idea of surrendering to what the baby is telling you they need is huge. Mm -hmm. Not only does it give you a sense of calm and confidence, mm -hmm. which is like this recurring theme, yeah. but it helps the baby be more calm and confident. Yes. So if you can think back to a time where you've approached your baby in a more calm and confident way compared to a really high strung, anxious way, how does your baby respond? Usually a baby is much more calm and calm. They can feel you. They can, they can feel that energy. Yeah, they can. The energy is, I mean, palpable mm -hmm. when a mm -hmm. mom is, is high anxiety. Right. And, and also, okay. So I, I can feel probably people feeling starting to feel anxious, like, okay, but I can't get there. Mm -hmm. you, you, there are multiple ways to get yourself into a calm state, right? So, so, and really be thinking about what is working for me and what is not working for mm -hmm. me. But one of the things that you can do is just some breathing exercises can, mm -hmm. can get you from a, I am totally like mm -hmm. to, okay, I'm, I'm going to be calm right now. So utilizing your breath, breathing in and breathing out and just focusing on that 
can really help. And in just a few moments, that can help. For sure. Um, maybe breathing in some um, pleasant smells like essential oils, which are really also good for your nervous system, mm -hmm. right? Um, lavender. Lavender. Mm -hmm. Focusing in on a blade of grass and just saying like, this is a moment that is going to pass. Mm -hmm. This is a moment in time and it's going to pass. It feels like it's going to last forever and yeah. it feels like this is my life and it feels awful. Yeah. And I feel all I can see is red and all I can feel is heat but it will end. And so that's the important thing is, is that it matters your state of mind and you deserve to enjoy your time with your baby. You, you are not, mm. you are not imprisoned by this. I just have to like give into all this. Yeah. You don't, you can choose those pieces. And, yeah. and I know that sometimes it doesn't feel like you can choose them. Mm -hmm. And if you're having a mood and anxiety disorder, you might need more than that. Um, and that's when the professionals come in like myself and psychiatrists and groups and things like that. But those are the things, those are the self care things that you can do. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. That self care piece is just so crucial. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, you got to speak up in that and you have to say like, I'm drowning here. Yes. So don't cry in the shower where no one can see you. Yes. If you feel like you need to cry and there's people around, just cry. Yes. You know, yes. and share that with your partner. Don't keep it a secret. You're not meant to be a rock. Right. And the problem is, is that when other moms are saying everything is great, it's perfect. I don't need help. And they're, they're putting forward that, that image. Um, it makes us feel like there is something really wrong with me yeah. that I'm not doing it. There is nothing wrong with you that you're not doing it. Yeah. It's a societal issue, mm -hmm. right? And so we have this conspiracy of silence mm -hmm. where we're just closeted about it and that's not good. Yeah. Right. So, so speak out mm -hmm. and, and we need to be there for each other. If you see somebody struggling and if you see somebody, you know, Hey, how's it going? Absolutely. Yeah. So there's been, you know, a few things that we've talked about that are just, they're so huge. Yeah. I mean, they're just these huge pillars of, like necessity yeah. when it comes to having a new baby. And, um, I just want to remind the mom that the new mom, that your baby's needs are all you have to focus on right now mm -hmm. and getting yourself in a position where you're not resenting that you're accepting that. And that it is your responsibility to keep the baby alive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And and then there's all these little tricks and hacks that we've talked about to help you do that. So yes. I hope that you find this really helpful. Um, what should a new mom do if she's feeling like she doesn't have any support? Mm. Where can she go? Mm -hmm. So I would say that... Um, uh, the number one and the kind of um, most obvious place to go would be to, to, to really find your voice and really be brave and speak to your OB about it. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, your OB has heard this a million times before. So she or he will not be shocked that you're saying I'm struggling. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, they should have resources for you. Um, hopefully you have a support group near you. Mm -hmm. um, if not, and, and a hospital too, maybe the hospital mm -hmm. that you gave birth at, can also have resources. We happen to live in an area where, um, and work in an area where there's a lot of resources for moms, but you may not. Um, there is a postpartum support international, which is a really amazing group, um, of, um, para professionals, professionals. They, um, there's information on support groups, information on therapists all around. Um, I was trained at the postpartum stress center in Pennsylvania with Karen Kleiman. There's also a lot of resources, um, at their website, the postpartum stress center, but, um, really your OB is the first place to start, mm -hmm. but really it's about finding your voice mm -hmm. and saying, I'm actually going to speak my truth mm -hmm. and I'm not going to um, shove this down and act like it's not happening. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard. It is yeah. really hard. And, and I would say bring your partner oh, with yeah. you to that OB appointment. That is a great idea. Yeah. That is a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Because he can say, okay, she may not be telling you everything, but this is really what's happening. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And, um, but this is what you can do. 
Right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Are there any good resources that you do recommend when it comes to reading books, yeah. websites, you know, mm-hmm. for moms, for dads, because moms read a lot. They do. They read a really lot. want that information. Yes, they do. But a lot of it is anxiety provoking. Yes, it is. Because if the baby's not doing what the book says that every single baby in the world should be doing, there's something wrong with my baby and there's yeah. something wrong with, with me. me. It's yeah. so unfair. Yeah, it's so unfair. It's so unfair. I mean, the most well-known books in the world about having a new baby, I say to moms, if there's anything in there that you read that makes your anxiety go like this, shut the book and give yeah. it to another friend. Yeah, that's right. Pass it along. It's not for you. That's right. That's right. And all the time that we spend thinking about, am I giving my child enough educational opportunities? I say if, if that is what's spinning you out, mm-hmm. I, I would say for, for that parent, stop doing that mm-hmm. and just be present. Mm-hmm. That is going to be more important than anything else. Right. right. Hold your baby. Hold your baby. Change your baby's diaper. Right. Feed your baby. Yes. Again, just focus on those basic needs. So I would say for um, resources, though. So when I was going through postpartum depression and anxiety, the, the resource that I read was the um, This Isn't What I Expected by mm-hmm. Karen Kleiman. Mm-hmm. And um, she, I felt like her voice really resonated with mm-hmm. me. So a mom who tended to towards perfectionism, tended towards um, not really understanding how important self-care was, the, her information just went right in and was incredibly helpful for Let's me. Let's show moms what the book looks like. Well, this is an old copy. <laughs> oh, but but this is what it this is what it used to look like. This is but... what it used to look like. <laughs> what does it look like now? Um, I can't remember. I think it has more of like a blue cover. Oh, okay. Yeah. This so is they went version. from pink to blue. Oh, for me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But it's the same. This isn't what I expected. Yes. And the good Uh, thing about this. So true. So true. That's exactly true. What a good topic. And then for dads, she wrote a book called The Postpartum Husband. Perfect. And it's basically that book, to me, basically that book, like a Cliff's Notes version, Mm -hmm. right? With like the chapters being like a page and a half maybe Mm -hmm. um, about how you can support your wife and what is postpartum depression, what Mm -hmm. is postpartum anxiety, when does it move from being baby blues to a clinical disorder, Mm -hmm. which baby blues is not a clinical disorder. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's really helpful. Mm -hmm. So that's great. And then Uh, postpartum support international, of course, is really good. Yeah. 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 I recommend staying away from the blogs. Oh yeah. Staying away from just a, you know, another mother's experience without any training, without any real experience. Um, I kind of say that across the board. There's a trend of sleep experts who are not trained who oh. just kind of have have um, been successful with crying it out methods. Or with their own baby. Or with their own, that's what I mean. Crying yeah. it out methods with their own babies. Yeah. And every baby is different. Yeah. Because every, okay, so these are their own little people with their own little personalities, with their own little spirits. They are not miniature us. Yeah. Right? So who we are is not who our children are. Yeah. And and just because this mom had a, had a good experience with this technique of whatever it is, feeding, eating, discipline, does not mean that that will work for you and yeah. your own child and your own um your own attachment bond with your own child and your right. relationship. Right. I happen to be a person who's pretty introverted and I like a lot of quiet and my second child came into the world very loud and very mm-hmm. extra. Yeah. And so it's a little bit of a mismatch and we had to work through a lot mm-hmm. because just the constant loud was difficult yeah. for me. Yeah. And so just acknowledging that this is what is, yeah. this is, this is what it is. Yeah. And, and she's her own person and And the other thing I want to say is that your child came into your life because you were supposed to be together. You are the perfect parent for this child, Mm -hmm. even when you don't even when you don't believe it and even when you especially don't feel it, mm-hmm. that they are teaching you something really important that you need to learn and you are teaching them something important and you are meant to be together. Mm-hmm. So we have gotten such good information for our moms today. And my goal for this topic is just to help a new mom know that you're not alone, first of all, right, and that everything that you're already doing with your baby is taking care of everything that you need to do to strengthen that attachment. And as your baby hits the six month mark, the nine month mark, the 12 month mark, you're just going to see them 
flourishing and mm -hmm. developing so much. And I can promise you that at the three month mark, it gets a little better. Yes. At the six month mark, it gets even better. And it just continues from there. Yes. So um, I like to say that it doesn't get easier, but you get better at it and you feel more <laughs> confident. Yes. So then it feels easier. Yes. And I just want to say thank you to Laura to mm -hmm. for being who you are first and foremost, um, you're, you are such a, such a pillar of strength in this community mm -hmm. and you're kind of like a celebrity in the postpartum mom world oh. when it comes to, to moms or we get to, we get to have love fests about you all the time <laughs> in classes. Yeah. Aww, so thank nice. you for being you and thank you for giving your time today to help these new moms wherever they are. Sure. And where can moms find you online if they want to contact you? Yeah. So um, I have a website, uh, therapistlaura.com. You can just kind of Google my name now and I'll just yeah. kind of come up. Laura Navarro Pickens, um, LCSW. Um, but I, I, I would just want to say that, you know, I kind of came to this field, I mean, sort of accidentally definitely not on purpose. Um, I, when I went to school, I studied older adults in social work and, mm -hmm. um, but my own experiences really struggling with the postpartum period and the pregnancy period and just kind of going through my own crisis of what is this, what is happening to my mm -hmm. life brought me to this field. And it is really a passion and I really love it. And I, I, you know, it's really, it really honestly is an honor to work with moms and dads mm -hmm. in this vulnerable time uh, when they are really struggling because, you know, it takes a lot of courage for people to open up their lives to you and talk about the hardest time in their lives. And it really is an honor to be with them, to partner with them, to help them through it and get them to the other side. I so agree with that. Yeah. I say that yeah. all the time. Yeah. It's such an honor for me to be on that Ooh. journey with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, just thank you for all that you do. And I know that you also see people remotely. I do. So, yeah. yeah. So if you're somewhere not close by, mm -hmm. Laura's here for you. And yeah. I can't recommend a better person to be on your postpartum journey with. Okay. So um, thank you again. Yeah, you're welcome. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> I call. So nice. You're awesome. You're awesome too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you really are awesome. And wrap. I'm Alex, the founder of The New Mom School. I was a new mom and going through the trenches, I learned the hard way so many things that I wish someone had been able to teach me in a class. So once I got through it, I collected information that's all evidence-based and gathered the most highly sought after experts in their field to teach new moms everything that you need to know once you get home from the hospital with that new baby of yours. We include information that will change your life, save your life, save your sanity, save your marriage, and give you all of the tools you need to actually enjoy being a mom. When I got home with my baby, I really felt like the joy was stripped away from me. And I don't want that for any other new mom. I want to help prevent that. I want you to know that that feeling that I had of being a hostage by your own baby, grieving the loss of your freedom was such a, a huge feeling. It was so heavy on my heart. I don't want anyone else to have to experience those feelings. So I have created this program with everything that you need, all the answers to your burning questions so that you don't have to learn the hard way like I did. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for allowing me to join you on your journey as a new mom. Everything's alright Cause it feels like I've opened my eyes again